there. My name is Melissa McHugh McGrath. I am the co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club. Um, we are the oldest AKC obedience club in the country. We're going to get into that a little bit in today's presentation. So you want to be a dog trainer. Um, we did this live yesterday on uh, 2221. And we're just re-recording today for clarity, just to make sure that the video and the audio are synced up. We had some technical difficulties because of a snowstorm. So I just wanna make sure that we got everything taken care of. So I am re-recording yesterday's presentation. We're gonna put it up on the internet and you can share with your friends. Hopefully this will give you some ideas as to what we deal with every day, what we trainers wish that we knew when we started and hopefully answer the questions that you guys had about how you can be a dog trainer and what to expect or at least expect the unexpected in this industry. All right, let's go. Okay, so it would be unfair for me to sit here and tell you that this, this is the only way that you can become a dog trainer. The truth is that this is an unregulated industry. If you've ever looked at a dog or you've read the book, Go Dog Go, you can go outside today right now, although I don't advise it, and put up a sign that says, I can train your dog. Um, my entire career, I have been dealing with that kind of um, very large looming issue um, because there is no one way to become a dog trainer and anyone can call themselves one, um, which can be really good. It's a low bar. It, it makes it easy for people like me who just want to teach and work with dogs to be able to get in very easily. Um, but it also allows for people who have no business handling dogs that might do a lot more harm than good to also come in and profit off of uh, maybe harming dogs or hurting dogs under the guise or the umbrella of training. Um, there are many colleagues of mine and I might have started and might have even been those unqualified people at first as we were learning the skill of the trade. Um, but if you've never worked in learning theory or have taken additional learning courses, um, you might even be able to get a TV show and write books and tell people how to train their dogs without having the, the criteria necessary to do this well. Um, so I think it's really important to recognize what qualified professionals, uh, what, what they might look like or what credentials they might have or how to see if, if you're working with somebody who's legitimate um, or somebody who is maybe sne selling snake oil. And that's really, really hard to do. And again, because it's unregulated, some of the best trainers I've ever met don't have certifications. Um, and some of the ones who have certifications might be selling snake oil. So it's really important to really listen to a lot of conversations and make learning a priority for you um, and always strive to be better. And I think that that's going to help you on this journey to be a dog trainer. Go to conferences, listen to people talking about the industry. Um, uh, dedicate your time to listening more than talking, and I think you're going to be okay. <laughs> so when I started at age 24, I could not go to the one school that I knew of at the time that existed. Um, it was the Academy for Dog Trainers. It was in California, and it was a 10-week program where I would have had to leave Boston with, you know, without my dog and go, and I couldn't afford a plane trip. I couldn't stay there for 10 weeks. I couldn't just pack up and go. I didn't have that luxury. Um, and I know a lot of people had worked really hard to be able to go and take that course, but that wasn't going to work uh, for my per particular situation when I fell into this business that I love so much. Um, but I did love a sport and that sport happened to be disc dogs. And when I was out helping running, uh, helping run a disc dog competition outside of Boston, a local dog trainer saw me explaining how to get people started in this sport. And he pulled me aside after and invited me to lunch said, I think you'd be a great dog trainer. Would you like to do this professionally? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> now we're going to talk about red flags later, and that might actually be one of them, but <laughs> I think it's important um, to, to recognize that we all get into this business in very different ways. And so the ways that I'm going to be talking about today, this might not be the only path. And I'm going to try to cover as many possible avenues for you. If you've been looking into this before, none of this will be unfamiliar, but maybe it's like a nice package for you to just be able to look at and go back for reference later. 
Um, I loved dogs. I absolutely loved dogs. Um, but as you find out in this industry, love isn't always enough. Um, I also want to check my bias here at the head and let you guys know where I'm coming from, because I know not all trainers are going to think the same way that I do. Um, I don't think the same way all trainers do. Again, it's an unregulated industry and there's lots of different theories as to how, what is the best methodology of training domestic dogs. Um, for me, I'm a CPDTKA. You will not be quizzed on that later, but it does come up a few times. CPDTKA means that I am a certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed. It basically means I sat for a very, very, very long test. Um, I had to go, um, I earned that certification in 2008. I had to go to New Hampshire at dark 30 in the morning. I took my certification exam sitting next to a guy in a testing center who was taking his pilot's exam and he kept crashing his plane. All of that while I'm trying to also answer questions on parvovirus and how best to fit a harness for a, a poodle. So it's really hard <laughs> to focus when you're in one of those big testing centers, but because CPDT is the only third party uh, certification option, that's the one that I took. It was also the cheapest and we'll get into that later. Um, but I think um, we're gonna be talking about different conferences you can go to and different ways that you can educate yourself as well. Um, I am a member of PPG, that is the Pet Professional Guild. They believe in no shock, no pain, no fear. They are a fear-free organization. That happens to be the way that I generally like to train um, and trying to meet the animal where they're at. And I know some people think, well, sometimes you can use this tool. I, I can't argue with them in that I don't believe in using those tools, but I have used them in the past when I got started. Um, but the more that I learned, the more that I learned that I actually didn't need them. If you can teach a tiger to present their tail for a blood draw, or you can teach uh, a wolf to present itself um, and come close to you so you can do a physical exam and look in its mouth without getting bitten, I believe you can teach a Shiba Inu to sit without using a prong collar. If you can teach a cat to do anything <laughs> with, a, with a clicker and a target stick, you can teach pretty much any animal, including domestic dogs, to do things that they're physically and emotionally capable of without using pain, fear, or force. Um, that's where I'm coming from. If you are not there, that's okay. You get to go on your own journey to figure out where on that spectrum that you feel comfortable. Um, but this presentation is coming from the perspective of somebody who believes in force-free training and certification in training. Um, so I think that's all of that. That's my bias. Um, oh, and I'm also a member of the AKC. Now that means the American Kennel Club, speaking of biases, some of you guys might have a very big feeling about those three letters, AKC. Some of you might be thinking, oh good, she's on my side. Um, some of you might be thinking, oh God, just pure breeds. Um, I like mutts. Um, some of you guys might have very visceral reactions or very, um, uh, big reactions and feelings about those three letters, and I do too. I am the co-training director of the oldest AKC obedience club in the country. We are an all-breed club, which also means all mixed-breed dogs. I personally believe in rescue, um, although I work with dogs who are purebred. I work with dogs who have been rescued or adopted. I work with every dog under the sun. So I think it's important that if you are somebody who believes in well, pure breed is the only way to go. That's cool, but you're going to be working with clients who get their dogs from rescue. If you work in rescue and only believe in rescue and you want to help people train their dogs, you're going to be working with people who got their dogs from breeders, either respect, respected and reputable breeders or not so much, maybe just off the internet in the same way that you, you might see in rescue as well. So it's important to check your biases at the door when you walk in, you are working with the dog in front of you. And that shouldn't matter if it is a purebred or a rescue animal. Um, so being, being the co-training director of the oldest obedience club in the country um, with rescue dogs personally and mixed pedigree dogs, I call mine an Adora Mutt to strike a hound. Um, it is important for me to also put that up at the head too, that like he, I, that's the world that I'm in. 
I personally don't compete in competition obedience, but my trainers and my colleagues there do. And so it's really important to check those biases at the door when you're walking into a space. So now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's continue on with the, uh, with the presentation. So several years ago, I wrote this book called Considerations for the City Dog. And, and the perspective that I took in that book was what we trainers talked about when we would have gin and tonics, or if we were out to dinner, um, or even just on the phone. Like the conversations that we had were very different than the conversations that my students were having. They wanted to know certain things and we wanted them to know certain things. And sometimes those things were not the same. Um, so I wrote that book from two very different perspectives with the what the students wanted to know and what the trainers wanted them to know um, about living with dogs in the city or just living with dogs in general. Um, so when I started this presentation, I wanted to do a very similar thing because I think it's eye-opening. And I think that even if you were to go into this um, and these first couple of slides are just right over your head because there's no connection to those things yet, it's okay. As you continue on with your journey, I want you to come back and look at these couple of slides and see if your perspective has changed. Um, so what I had done, I had gone to the internet, I tried to use Facebook for good, and I asked a bunch of trainers what they thought. But first, I wanted to write down what the things were that I wanted you guys to know. And when I proposed this talk, I was thinking more in the lines of bodily fluids. You are going to handle so many more bodily fluids than, than you probably could even imagine. Vomit, urine, poop, liquid poop. You get to, you get very intimately aware of all the kinds of poop that can come out of an animal. Um, and you have to clean it and you have to disinfect it. And you might be late meeting your friends because you have to take an extra hour after because somebody got violently ill in your class. Um, all the humping, so much humping. There is a lot of humping, <laughs> often non-consensual in your classroom spaces between dogs, um, either to human legs or if it's a puppy class and they're all off leash and they're socializing and somebody discovers that they have a new thing they can do, you might have some more humping adventures um, and it becomes more interesting. Um, you get to see all the shades of red that people turn when there are children in the room and you are trying to explain humping. Um, so those, those things, you have to become very comfortable um, talking about recognizing um, you also need to know way more about body language than you do right now. And I'm saying that as somebody who's been training for 17 years, I need to still learn more about dog body language and communication um, and how we humans can, uh, how we speak and work with and communicate with our bodies to animals, including dogs and each other. Um, you learn a lot about body language, and that is something that you never get to stop learning about. And I think that that is very, very, very valuable. So if you're coming into this green, you're going to have to start with a resource guide. And if you don't, um, if you've been doing this for a while, not if you don't, if, you, if, you've, if you're not green, if you've been doing this for a while, you still need to learn more about body language. Every dinner party you go to, somebody's going to come up to you going, oh, you're a dog trainer? So my dog does this weird thing um, every time. You are going to be singled out at parties. You are going to be singled out pretty much everywhere you go. I love dogs too. Like, <laughs> so you're going to get in a lot of uh, conversation. So if you like that kind of thing, that's going to be good for you. If you don't, maybe just tell people you're an accountant. Um, every third email you get will be, can you teach my dog, my emotional support dog to stop fighting people? So you have to get very comfortable with terminology and what those things mean. Um, and I've been working on a second book that is kind of similar to this presentation, the things they don't tell you when you become a dog trainer um, and the things that people should know when they go in. And that's one of them. Like I thought I knew what an emotional support dog was. I thought I knew what a service dog was, but when I got into the legality of it all, it's a lot more complicated than I think most people think. So really know what those terms are. Don't just look at something on the internet really dive into the Americans with Disabilities Act and learn exactly what a service animal, service dog, or miniature horse is the only exception, can do for their human, how an emotional support animal is different, and how a therapy dog is different. That's your, that's your homework for this week. I'm a trainer. I can give you homework. 
So then I asked my, my colleagues and my friends from around the world, like, what did they think? What did they think that they wanted to know when they were younger or what, if they could go back in time and talk to themselves, these were the things that they said. Um, and again, you might not grasp these things yet, but these are from trainers who are certified professionals in this world and have been working for quite some time in this business. So come back and listen to this part again in six months or a year and see if any of these are clicking if they are not right now. Um, so I had, I wish I knew at the beginning how important it is to just observe dogs, find a place where you can watch and watch and watch. And that's my friend, Steve Goodall from Barks from the Bookshelf. That's a podcast I'm gonna be referencing a little bit later. Um, and he's the owner of Goodall Dog Training in the UK. Um, I would also like to add a little addendum to this saying, when I started, when I was thrown into my first dog training class, I had been shadowing a guy for about three months and he put me in a class with 11 dogs by myself. I didn't have help. I really shouldn't have been there. I didn't know that. I thought it was like, oh, this is great. I get my own class. But looking back in hindsight, that was a really, really, really bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> Um, and a red flag, but he had me observe. He had me watch and watch and watch, but I didn't have a rule book. That would be like, if I took my friend Steve and he was unfamiliar with American football and I just told him to watch it, just watch it. You'll figure it out. Just observe, but you don't know what the rules are. Or he could have me sit down and watch cricket. I don't know what those rules are. Um, if you're not given any guidance or support through your observations, at least at the beginning, it can be very daunting and you don't know what you're looking for. So there is a book out there. I'm going to reference it at the end, but I'm going to tell you what it is right now. It's called Doggy Language by Lily Chin. Um, Lily Chin is an artist that has helped almost every single professional dog trainer, um, reputable trainer that you help, you will ever meet by illustrating dog body language, stress, how to interact appropriately with kids and dogs. Um, her work, even though she's not a trainer, her art has gone on to save without hyperbole, thousands, if not millions of dogs around the world. Um, and she just wrote a book called um, Doggy Language, highly recommended. Take that as your field manual and go and see if you can find five examples of stress between two dogs that are interacting. See if you can find uh, two examples of a happy dog that are not just wagging tail. So give yourself like little tasks with that book. And I think that'll help you with this observation piece. It's people job more than a dog job. Now, Diane Kirkji in here from Every Dog, Tra Every Dog Training Center in Danvers is going to get the credit for this. But everyone else also said this, like you can't, um, I love dogs, but I hate people. This is not going to be the job for you. Um, you really, really, really must love people. It's a collaborative job. The best trainers work with others to fill in the gaps and keep learning. All th you can't help everyone ask for help. You don't have to do it all. And, and Connor, Yana, and Sassafras are all very, very correct in this. Most of my job is assessing a dog and saying, oh, you need to be in this sport. Or, oh, you need to be, uh, you need more significant behavioral assistance than I can give you. So go see this professional. So a lot of my job is working with other colleagues or I'll get calls from colleagues saying, oh, this dog is for you. This is a punk adolescent. He's right up your alley. He needs to do a sport, um, but he also needs impulse control. Like, give me all those, give me all the frat boy dogs. Um, so sending and making a big list of people that you can share to work with and, and distribute fairly is, it's so important. You cannot do it all. There's so much to this industry um, that if you are in it, you have to be aware that there are more people here and we can help each other. And it's better not to be resource guardy about clients, share them. Go with the flow, dogs do dog things, find humor and don't get frustrated. Again, humping. You should also have some desire to run your own business. And, and Alex here is absolutely correct. Um, most dog trainers, you're not going to be able to go um, right off the bat, you might be working for somebody for a while and then spin off and do your own thing. You might work for somebody forever. That's cool. But a lot of our job is renting from other facilities. Um, New England Dog Training Club, we rent from a school. Um, I also, as a contractor, rent from Diane. It's a people job more than a dog job. So when I'm teaching sports, I'm, tr I'm renting her space. Um, there's a lot of 
there are people who have their own businesses and then there are contractors who go in and work in those businesses. Um, I will say the downside to that, aside from like, yes, you need to have your own insurance. You have to be bonded, but you also like, well, <laughs> like this, um, if you are injured and you cannot work, you might, you might not be able to get those clients. Like you might have to pass off that class if it's a, if it's a prolonged injury. When I was pregnant with my daughter, I had a baby. Um, I taught up through nine months of, of pregnancy. And then after I had her, I couldn't work for months. And, and it's not like I could just go to my boss and be like, Hey, can I have medical leave? That's not a thing that you usually come across. You have to be planning. You are going to either be a contractor or an employee of somebody else. And unless you jump right off the bat and you happen to have the capital to buy your own dog training facility from the jump, most don't. So that is a very important thing to look at, like how much business acumen do you have and the social media aspect, the taxes aspect, all of it. It's probably going to be on you. If you teach group classes, you should like being the center of attention. I have to mention that this was written by my former boss and this made me laugh so hard because I do. I mean, look at me, come on. Um, so if, if you're running a, a class um, and you have a bunch of people, if you are very uncomfortable around a lot of people, you might have to work on that skill if you're going to teach group classes. If not, I mean, some people override it, some people just like to do private sessions where it's one-on-one -on -one with a family or one person. And that's also totally valid. And we're going to get into that later too. Temper your expectations of your clients to your training plan. Now, I think Francine is correct here in that if I get a call and they're like, hey, my dog is jumping. My dog is jumping at visitors and I just need help. Great. If my plan is show up at their house with a bunch of baby gates, maybe some clickers and candy, or for like, if she has kids, here kids have some candy, have some treats for the dog. And I roll in and while well, the kid's diabetic, the gates aren't gonna work because it's an open concept floor plan. And oh, maybe the owner has hurt their shoulder and they can't effectively use the clicker right now. Or maybe because they have 17 children running around, that clicker is going to be lost in four seconds. And this is not going to be a tool that will work very well for them. So I think it's really, really, really important that even the best laid plans, they need to work with that family and that environment. And if you lay it down, it's up to them to pick it up, but it's also up to you to help them be flexible if they're willing to meet you part way. Puppies and adults are different. That is true. Find your niche, be the best Briard disc dog trainer ever, and you can specialize. All of this is to say this theme is great. There are different stages of working with dogs. If you're working with puppies, you might come at that very differently than working with adult dogs. I personally get stressed out if I'm running too many puppy classes at a time. I like to take one or two a year. Um, online is fine. I get stressed out during the socialization part, um, but my colleague and other co-training director here, Donna, she should be the like patron saint of all things puppy class. She is awesome. This is her Xanax. And for me, it makes me a little panicky. Like I love taking them once or twice a year. It's like eating a really good fudgy brownie. But if I have too many, then I get sick. Um, but for her, she can do this all day. Me, it's punk adolescent dogs who are just kind of a little jerky, but funny and hilarious. And they're not listening to their owners. Those are my dogs. Those are the ones that I will take every day to Sunday. Um, and, and I think it's really important to recognize where you're more comfortable and how you can work with these dogs. Get compassion fatigue training before you need it. And that is from our club president, Jess Fry. Um, and I added the addendum and you'll need it. When you, because this is a people job more than a dog job, you're going to have cases that are hard, especially now in COVID. Um, you're going to be dealing with people's emotional pain um, and you're going to be dealing with dogs who maybe people can't afford um, the care that they need for their dog. Maybe they lost their job or maybe they just can't, like this dog that they love has a massive behavior issue um, and it's getting worse over time, but they can't afford to go to the veterinary behaviorist. So they're doing the best they can with a trainer or maybe a behavior specialist, a bit, which we're gonna go over later what that is. 
Um, it's not really a thing, but we're going to cover it. Um, it's going to be harder for those um, for those owners to try to make things work. And if you are their trainer and you are their support system and they're getting in over their heads, you might have to have some very hard conversations and or find somebody who can have those harder conversations and that comes home with you. And if you're doing this long-term and this is your job, that can get really hard, especially if you find yourself in cases like, um, although not necessarily could be anything, but the three big, the three big ones, the three sisters, behavioral euthanasia, behavioral uh, modification medication, and rehoming. When you're dealing with those three things, or if you come into that situation, it's not like TV. You can't fix a lot of things in, in a day. Um, and I think it's that's also really important to recognize too. And the expectations of a lot of owners, because they've seen things on TV, um, whether it's good training or not great training, um, if they see it on TV and it's heavily edited, it looks like magic and it looks like it's a very fast turnaround. But I promise you, most of what we do looks boring and takes a lot longer than is promoted on TV. So when the expectation is here and you're meeting people, it's a lot harder um, and it's a lot more pressure on the trainer to quote, get it right and to make changes faster. And we can't. Wait, this isn't regulated? Everyone. So yeah, unregulated industry, that's a thing. How much time I'd be instructing on behavior, not, I'm oh, sorry, how much time I'd be instructing not on behavior, but on a dog's physical and emotional needs. If you're going into a home for a dog who's jumping, but you get there and you realize that the dog isn't maybe jumping because he's happy, he's jumping to push people away from him. And he's giving all these stress signals that the owners haven't noticed. Most people will call you for a growl, a lunge or a bite but there's multiple signals and signs before that, that the dog is very unhappy. So a lot of the times when you go in, you're actually trying to instruct them on like these lower level signs to try to help give the dog space. Maybe not even say, we're gonna teach your dog to stop jumping. We're gonna teach your dog to take space and we're gonna teach you to advocate for your dog. And I think um, that is a very important thing to talk about and to put out there. So non-dog trainers, what did you guys want to know? This is a very different list. Um, they wanted to know, um, uh, how do I feed? Oh, sorry. How do I find a mentor or, sorry about that. My, my text got very, very small. How do I find a mentor or can I inter intern or assist? Are there good schools? And how do I choose an educational program, which we're going to cover here in a few minutes? How long does it take? Well, it depends. We're going to go over that too. Do I have to take behavior cases if I become a trainer? Conversely, if I only want to do behavior cases, can I do just those? Yes, but we're going to, we'll get into it. What's the difference between a behaviorist and a trainer? That's a big one. And we're going to cover that as well in today's presentation. The business side of things, how much do you charge? How do you get clients and liability insurance? We're not really covering the business side of things today, but there are, um, there are ways that you can find out for your region what people are charging. You can kind of just do a quick Google search and just kind of see what people are charging, um, how to get clients. You have to have a social presence. You have to like be connected maybe with veterinarians or rescue groups um, and, and just become known in the community, but be working with people who know what they're doing. And that's going to help. Don't burn bridges, no matter how difficult it might be. The dog community is very, very, um, there's a lot of us, but it is a small world. And I think that is really important not to burn bridges. Liability insurance, generally speaking, you have to be a member of an organization like um, uh, APDT, Association of Pet Dog Trainers. For me, it's PPG, Pet Professional Guild. Um, there are many of these like little um, professional organizations that will offer an in for your liability insurance. Um, but I did also wanna share, I, I got an email from a former assistant of mine and I wanted to share what she said. And I think that this is important. I looked into training because I disliked my job and seeing dogs just made me happy. But after volunteering with you, I realized it is difficult work and it requires a lot of dog handling experience to understand body language. 
so she helps dogs at a shelter. Um, my, my friend here, my um, former intern, she does help dogs at a local shelter. Um, she decided that making this her career was not going to ultimately make her happy, though being around dogs did. So if that's going to be you through today's presentation, there is no shame in that. In fact, that's why we're offering this presentation for free, uh, because we want people to see all sides of this and make decisions now instead of getting into it and realizing, ooh, maybe, maybe this is harder than I thought. Um, for her, it ended up being a better hobby than a career. And that, that is super cool. And I think that that's really, really important. It takes a lot to make this your career. Um, so if, uh, just because you love dogs, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make it your job, but maybe you still wanna like still kind of play with these dogs and see how it goes. So hopefully, you know, like hopefully this will help you decide if it's for you or not for you. And either way, it's perfectly okay. So let me go on to the next one. So today we are going to cover misconceptions, educational certificates and certifications, terminology, red flags. I'll tell a couple stories if we have time. Um, but first, remember what I was talking about here at the very, very beginning of today's presentation. Um, overwhelmingly, the number one thing that dogs trainers on my social media chimed in with for this project and for a book that I'm writing about people who wanna work with dogs, um, many of us started in this industry because we either loved dogs and wanted to play with puppies or we loved our own dog who is struggling and we fell into this arena so i'm going to address this right now i love dogs but i hate people is not going to make you a happy dog trainer the number one thing i hear over and over and over from interns and assistants and colleagues people at dinner parties uh maybe not colleagues you're so lucky you get to work with dogs. You get to play with puppies all day. I want to be a dog trainer too. I just hate people, but I love animals so much. Um, this is not going to work for you. You have to love all the people, even the jerks. And you might not have to love them, but you at least have to know that they exist and can handle them. Um, so right now, I think nothing brings us home more than during COVID. Right now, all of my classes and presentations are talking to myself in a bedroom, to other people on the other side of a screen. I'm not talking to the dog. I'm not handling a leash. I have to communicate to these humans, either what their dog needs, what they should do, help them problem solve for their particular environment. Um, I, I have to work a lot harder to communicate with these people now that I am not able to like physically show them what I mean. So I have to be very articulate and clear um, it is a teaching job um, and it, you just happen to be around dogs. Dogs are the bonus. You are going to be human dog bilingual if you, if you do this right. Um, and if this isn't your cup of tea, that is okay. There are dozens of dog jobs that you can do that will allow you to love animals and still hate people and not talk to them. Um, so, or not many, it might be just less people-y. So I'm going to put another thing up here, um, a presentation I did for children um, over the summer, totally appropriate for you too, it might get the wheels spinning, but jobs that you can do that are maybe off the beaten path that allow you to work with animals. So that might help you get started. Um, so misconceptions. And with that <laughs> comes all the cleaning of the poop getting bitten by little shark teeth, lots of clothing changes, uh, socialization protocols that may or may not be going well, vomit, opinions from people not in our industry, um, like uh, breeders may be telling you how to, uh, breeders telling clients how to train their dogs um, or opinions on food. Like you're gonna be asked a lot of questions about nutrition. You're not a nutritionist, you're a dog trainer. Um, so learning when to stay in your lane. My dog is limping. Should I take him to the vet? Yes, I guess. Like I always say, yes, call your vet because I'm not a vet. So it's really important to stay in your lane while still playing nice with others. Um, and hope that by setting that example, um, your veterinarians won't be giving out training advice. They'll send you to the trainer. Uh, we shouldn't be giving advice on breeding protocols. Um, we can have opinions about it, but we shouldn't be giving advice. That's not our lane unless you are also a breeder. Um, so you are going to get to play with puppies 
sometimes. Um, but what you are really doing is teaching clients that they shouldn't maybe hold their puppy's mouth closed while yelling no bite over and over and over again, right? So you are instructing that owner how to work with their puppy. And I get it. I love puppies. I do. I do. I, and as I was saying before, like my colleague Donna, she loves puppies. It's her Xanax. For me, frat boy dogs all the time. Um, but, you know, we all have the thing in this industry that we like, right? So for me, it's sports and adolescence, the occasional behavior case. Um, and some people, it's dog showing. Um, so this is a picture here on the left. Um, this is um, one of our students and former board members of NEDTC training her dog. Um, and she's doing some exercises where she's working on extended stays. Um, so her dog is over here. There are, if you look to the left of that photo, um, I'm not sure if you can see that here. You, you can, cool. Um, there are dogs over here in this other ring. We have three rings going on and there's, there's probably that night, probably at least 10 to 15 dogs that this dog is ignoring. So if you like to teach that kind of stuff, if you just like to teach competition obedience, you can do that. Um, sheep herding, disc dogs, service dog training, uh, trick dog, Sassafras Lowry from one of the earlier slides. She is a certified trick dog instructor. That's her whole jam. She teaches tricks. And as far as I know, that's the thing that she teaches. She doesn't do behavior cases. I, I don't think. Um, Sassafras, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. I'm using you to make a point and I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Um, but my understanding is that she's a certified trick dog instructor and that's her thing. So find your niche. And if there's a thing in here, like we have a lot of people now that are looking to really try to help people with service dogs. Um, there's a lot of snake oil salespeople out there that are trying to sell service dogs that are not trained to be service dogs. And then there are legitimate organizations, but these dogs are so expensive that it's cost prohibitive for people who need these dogs. So you're now seeing a crop of trainers coming up now that are working really hard to understand the world of service dog training, train service dogs using positive reinforcement and then trying to help these people who really need affordable service dogs or care. And I think that is super, super, super important and very noble work, work I am not cut out for. So again, you can't do it all, find the thing that you love um, and make friends in this industry who can do those things. I send any service dog request to my friend, Sharon. Um, so classes might look different depending on how you're teaching them. Here are two classes in one night. Um, I want you guys to picture though, before you read these things, a traditional six week puppy class, right? Or a regular six week obedience class or a sports class. You usually have one room, you might have um, your class or a class and then they leave and then back into that room come a next group of dogs, right? Well, at New England Dog Training Club, we do things a little bit differently. And this is what you might see. And, and I would encourage you all to go observe different methods of teaching classes. This is organized chaos. Um, what we do here at the um, at Cambridge Friends School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when we don't have COVID, is we rent a school and we go in there into a gym and we set up rings. We'll have three rings of dogs going on at the same time. We have 14 trainers and we are only there for three nights. Uh, three hours every Thursday night. Um, when we are teaching, we could have up to 10, 12 dogs in a ring. Sometimes if one ring is empty, we'll take up to 15 or 20 dogs in one ring. But we have a lot of support. It's not just one trainer in one room with 20 dogs. That to me feels irresponsible. But we have 14 trainers who are buzzing around, who are helping, who are guiding people, who are helping people in that ring. And then we have one basic ring leader, the lead trainer, who's kind of orchestrating the whole thing. Hey, you guys are all gonna work on this one exercise. The other trainers are gonna buzz around and help you. Um, and, and people are getting one-on-one -on -one attention and they're still getting the very, very distracting environment which, the, <laughs> which they are paying us for. Um, but then you compare that. Like if you look at the dogs here on the left, these dogs all have leashes. They have attention on their handlers. Their owners are learning how to focus with all of this chaos. It's a gym, so it is very loud and echoey. And these dogs are learning to ignore it. And these people are learning to ignore it, all with positive reinforcement. Um, there are three classes in this gym at the same time. 
And there are dogs that we call the fun police. So as a result, we can't let dogs play. We can't, we don't encourage people to let their dogs meet each other when they're in the training space. However, the same night you walk one room away and we have a special room that we used for puppies. And in this case, the puppies, what are leashes? What's attention? Like they're puppies, right? Um, the owners are constantly distracted because they're all like, oh, like, and honestly, that's why I don't teach a lot of puppy classes because I get really distracted too. You have to sanitize before and after because they are not vaccinated. They're not fully vaccinated yet, but the socialization protocol needs to happen before they're 16 weeks of age. So you get them into the classes, um, but you still have to make sure that everybody's safe. So you're not letting in older dogs. You're not exposing these puppies to anybody but puppies who are on their vaccination schedule. Um, so you have to be very aware of that and you have to take a lot of care to clean before and after these puppies come in. And then there's just more general splattiness in a puppy class than in an adult class, right? Um, so I would suggest to look at the format of the classes that you are in and then see as many types of classes as you can as possible. Is it a traditional six week class? Is it a steps class? Like we teach steps classes, generally speaking through any DTC. And that is um, everybody comes in at the same level, level one, unless you're a puppy student. So in level one, your dog needs to learn its name. Name means look at me. They need to know how to sit five times for one treat. And they need to learn how to walk halfway down that ring with a cheese stick up their nose. That's it. Um, they're really just acclimating to the room. And then they move on to step two, which is impulse control, leave it and stay and more complicated walking behaviors and recall through a group of dogs. Level three or step three is, um, is more real life situations. Step four is the canine good citizen test. And you progress as you go through the classes, you personally get checked off and you are going at your own pace. If you can't make it every week, that's fine. Red Sox might be in the World Series. That's okay, miss a week. But for the trainers, there's a big burden on them because they don't know which students are coming on any given night. You might have two students in your ring. You might have 15 in your ring. So you're basically planning these, these lessons as people are walking into your room so you can see the group and what you can do in the space that you have. Compared to a traditional six-week class, which I also teach in other facilities, um, you are going week one, we're going to do sit down, touch and name recognition. Week two, we're going to do loose leash walking um, and go to bed. Week three, we're going to do recall and leave it. Um, so each week you're working on new skills, you may or may not learn that skill to completion before having to move on to the next thing. Um, and that's a downside, but you get through the class and you're, you're hoping that the students are working more on their own outside of class. Um, so pros and cons to both of those structural models, and I do teach both. Um, it is really important to watch different kinds of classes if you wanna be an instructor to kind of see like what you like, what you don't, and, and start to formulate what's going to work for you as a teacher. Um, setting boundaries is important, and I would say one of the most important things. These are two dogs who are having a great time. They're having a grand old time. Though, if I were to dissect every quote stress signal as I might ask my new students to do, my new dog training students to do, um, they might point out whale eye, which is this look here. Mouths are open, ears are back, right? Paw is up. Right. So like if you look at each piece of this dog, you might read this as, oh, this dog's really stressed out. But if you look at the whole dog, these are two floppy German shepherds who are having a great time side by side playing, running, having a good time. In the context of this, this is a good play experience. I'm going to tell you what my biases are right now and what my boundary is. I don't work with a lot of, quote, happy dogs. I don't go to the dog park. They stress me out because you don't often see just this. You might see a lot of dogs who are really uncomfortable, stiff faces, stiff bodies, staring, scared, hiding. Um, maybe some dogs are, are picking on one dog who can't get away and the prey drive is kicking in. I've seen a lot of fights at a dog park. I don't usually take the quote happy dogs because my personal experience working with highly reactive dogs, 
has me in a position where I'm almost always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, so when I'm taking private cases, this, if somebody's like, I want to work on off leash handling with my dog. I would send that person to my friend, Jordan at Neighborhood Paws and be like, yo, Jordan, here you go. <laughs> like, um, and Jordan also happens to be a New England dog trainer instructor. So I trust them to take this dog and to do really good things because Jordan's experience is different than mine. And Jordan is better at this kind of thing than I am. Um, so I even trust Jordan to take my dog hiking because off-leash dogs stress me out so much because I don't trust that that other owner can call their dog back. I can call captain back. I can't trust if they will call their dog back. I have seen too many fights. So I need to go to therapy before I can, <laughs> before I can do this. So I pay my friend Jordan to take my dog on hiking. And that's a boundary that I set. And that makes me feel better. My dog gets to have a good time. I know he's in good hands and I know Jordan can handle it. I cannot, and that's okay. Um, so it does take a supportive network and a village to help you. Um, but if there are things that make you uncomfortable, don't feel like you need to handle it. You can, you can say, I'm going to take this case. I'm not going to take this case. And that's why you need to have a lot of friends in this industry. Be prepared. You are going to have lots of things that come at you that you are not going to expect. Um, and families might want to come to classes together and you may not be great with kids or you might not even like children but they might be in your class. So you have to at least pretend that you like children. Um, I like having kids in most of my classes, as long as I know that I, I'm upfront with the owners. Like if your dog, if your kid is too distracting, I might ask that they don't come back the following week, but as long as they can sit quietly or they can participate, or maybe even they can help me with a couple exercises, I'll call kids out to help me run. Like maybe, can you help me move this agility equipment? Or, oh, can you go put that bar back up? Thanks, that's a big help. So incorporating little kids in your classes can actually be really fun if you have the right dogs for it. Um, if I'm running a reactive dog class, I'm not gonna have kids in that classroom. Um, but finding an appropriate place for these children. Um, if you have an assistant, you can send the assistant over if mom, cause it's usually mom with the dog and the kids, not always, but often um, that she's trying to handle the dog and handle the kids and pay attention to the teacher. It's a lot. So if you have a good assistant, sending the assistant over to just like play with the kids while mom is trying to train the dog can be really, really helpful. If you don't do what I did, give the kids chalk and say, Hey, draw on the floor and I'll mop it up later. Um, so reactive dogs at new England dog training club, you have to have um, a plan for reactive dogs. So at any DTC, uh, again, we have 14 trainers, so we have plenty of people to grab a dog and the family and get them out of the ring if they're overwhelmed, and they can work with them in a different part of the school. Um, we usually would use maybe the foyer or maybe a side, um, open up a door. There's like a little storage area, giant room that we can take dogs in, or we can take them outside um, and work with them below a threshold of stress. Um, at every dog, it's one room and I might have an assistant, I might not have an assistant, but if somebody's getting really upset, we have these cool walls that have wheels on them that I can put wherever I need to create a space for a dog so they can't see what's going on um, and everyone is safe. Um, if the dog is just mildly set off by things or just really excited, like, oh boy, look, there are other dogs, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, I can set up white gate to put a blanket down. Um, over the gate, creating like a partial barrier. Um, so the dog can like peek out and be like, I see you and then get called back. Um, so there are ways that you can work at MSPCA. I have even a smaller space and I may or may not have an assistant. Um, or if I do have an assistant, it's not usually one that I pick. They're usually assigned to me. So I, I might not know where their skill level is yet. So I might not feel comfortable sending an assistant over to handle it yet. I might have to train my assistant or my volunteer. So there I might, I can only take four dogs in that space. That's what I'm comfortable with in that smaller room. So I might have a musical dogs class. I send one dog out to work on loose leash walking out on a path that I can see from my, my room because um, it's all glass windows. So I can have them practice walking and then send them in through the second door, send one dog out the first door and then just kind of have rotating stuff. And the three dogs inside, they might be working on leave it or they might be working on something else. So this way I can control the space a little bit better if I need to. Always have a plan, know how you can use your space. And if something isn't going right, how can you use the space that is given to you 
with the tools that you have. Always do the best you can with the tools that you have. Have a whoopsie bucket nearby with bags, paper towels, more paper towels than you think that you're going to need, enzymatic spray to break down urine and fecal bacteria and odor, um, AOE deodorizer. Don't use Febreze. That chemical smell might be overwhelming for many dogs in your ring. Have a sick dog protocol. So think about what happens if maybe a dog has a seizure in your class. That happened to me last year. Um, and, and what happens if you're paying rent to the space that the dog has a seizure, or if you own the place where the dog has a seizure, there might be two different things that you can do. Um, making sure that you know exactly how to handle a medical emergency calmly, um, and to help your student because they are also dealing with a medical emergency with their dog. Know where the nearest hospitals are and how to get there. Maybe even have cards with the hospital or, um, at the front desk so you can just hand it, say go, drive, um, and, and help them. What happens if a dog vomits in class? What happens if they have pink eye? What if they have papilloma, which is basically puppy herpes? Um, you know, what happens if there's a broken leash in a dog fight? Um, you have to know, you always have to have a plan B and you have to know how to handle these things in the event something goes wrong and hope it never does. Um, so again, mom is working in this picture, two kids by herself, she was distracted, she couldn't focus. You need to be accountable too. When that chalk didn't wipe up <laughs> as I thought it might, because I would draw on the floor all the time. I would draw X's on the floor and like have people like go X to X to X, like as walking exercises and it always came up, but I didn't plan on a four-year-old really drawing and getting it in there. So like, I went up and helped clean up a couple of days after this event when it was clear that this wasn't gonna come up. So I did a lot of mopping. Um, it took about six or eight months for that to finally come up of, of all of us washing it all the time. Um, but I think that that's always important. Be accountable, own your mistakes. That was a mistake. Maybe I'll just lay down paper and do markers next time um, and always think of a plan B. So here's what you guys are probably here for, the education. So like certificates, assistance, interning, how do you do it? So the one that I, I think never gets enough credit but is always recommended is shelter dog programs where you can walk dogs. The best one in my region, hands down, and, and I, again, checking my biases because I think that's important. I work for the MSPCA as a trainer. I have never done the dog walking program. I have never been a volunteer at the MSPCA, although some of my students have been, some of my interns have been. Um, but um, the MSPCA has a program created by an applied animal behaviorist named Terry Bright. Um, and she works with volunteers to train you how to work with dogs. And again, it's less people-y than training people. So they might say, can you get this dog to walk? Can you help assess like if this dog is comfortable by city, in city noises? Um, is this dog falling apart? Is this dog highly reactive to skateboards or, or other people? What are your observations? So it's teaching you how to look without the pressure of trying to instruct that information to another person. So it's kind of, it's a great step in learning how to read dogs. Um, intern programs. We get tons of inquiries every year at New England Dog Training Club about our intern program. We have interns start, and, and every program is different, but the way we do it, our interns start by showing up early and schlepping mats, laying mats down on the gym floor because we can't have dogs scraping up the kids' gym floor. So we have these 250-pound mats. We've got, I think, 14 of them that we have to lay down to cover every surface that dogs touch. So from outside to inside the other puppy room, we have to lay down these giant roofing mats. Um, and I think um, we'll have them organize harnesses and get familiar with equipment. And then once they kind of know how things are in like the layout of the space and they can help us clean up accidents, um, then we might start giving them a little bit more um, responsibility. If I'm doing recall exercises, come when called with a long line, I might stand in a hallway and call an intern. Hey, can we're gonna do a restrained recall. I need you intern to hold this leash and I'll stand next to them, but they are now handling the dog. And then I'll send the client down, okay, call your dog. And when they do, the intern runs behind. So we're, we'll start getting them just like little bits of, of um, touching the dogs and the leashes, 
um, oh, wait, I need somebody to size this harness. Can you go size this harness after they're instructed as to how to size harnesses? Um, so we're, we start to give them more and more responsibility over a two year window. And if, you know, like, and there's in our rings and we say, oh, can you teach the sit exercise? Can you teach the down exercise? Can you teach the touch exercise? Um, can you help us with a canine good citizen test? Can you hold this dog for three minutes while the owner leaves? Um, so we give them more and more responsibility. And then when we trust that they can teach, they then start leading the classes and we senior trainers become their assistants. So if they get stuck, we can just jump in and help and then back right off. So we give them more and more responsibility with a lot of support and guidance. And we also try to run a class for them if we have enough trainers on site that night. Um, where we go over the things that they might learn in the dog training exam if they sit for the CPDT test or any test that they might be taking. We've had Victoria Stillwell students, which I'm going to go over in a minute. Um, but if they're studying for an exam, we take an hour every week and we try to cover things that they're likely going to get tested on so that way they are prepared. So I don't want to see while these interns aren't getting paid, and I think that that is something that we really should look into um, as an industry, they're getting tons of experience, 14 trainers that they can touch base with. Um, but one red flag that I would highly recommend against, do not pay to be an intern. Um, there, that has never felt good for me. Um, and I know a lot of trainers do it. Oh, if you wanna be my intern, you can pay me. No, interns aren't making enough, they're contractors as it is. Um, there is no way I would ever ask somebody to pay me to be an intern. Um, there are ways to get your experience without also having to shell out money. So be careful of that. Um, so uh, you could do an online school um, and I'm gonna go into some of these here later. And some of these where you might learn learning theory, which is super necessary and a big, big, big thing that you're gonna need to know. Uh, business acumen, client side issues, how to train skills, who to call for help if you need extra support. Um, and then there's in-person schools where you can go for like a 10 day or five day or a four week program. Um, there's online, and, uh, sorry, there are in-person animal behavior programs at colleges and universities that are much more expensive, but again, you're getting a really solid education. Um, and there are so many footholds to start um, all these different kinds of programs, varying costs, different levels of experience, commitment levels. But I think it's fair to say that when I started 17 years ago, the crop of trainers that came up with me tended to be people who assisted a mentor um, and then kind of went off in their own direction and, and got enough skill set that they could break off on their own and get hired by other people as well. Um, and they supplemented with conferences, seminars, books, and then got certifications on their own. Okay, not a full list. Uh, CPDT, the only certification vetted by a third party, as I mentioned before, self-directed. Uh, lots of reading on your own. Uh, you have to have another trainer sign off on your skills. It's great for somebody who's self-motivated. It's not a classroom environment. So if that makes you uncomfortable, this might be a good option for you. Um, and uh, you do have to spreadsheet all your work and log your training hours. You need to have at least 375 hours of training. Um, but I will also say with this, um, it's the least expensive of all of the options I'm going to present to you. But again, like some of the best trainers I know are not certified, um, but there is a push to get, um, there's a push and a very valid one to start to regulate our industry. So even if, um, whether it's with testing or a fee or something, there's going to be some accountability, I predict sometime in the near future for dog trainers. So if financially it's hard, this might be your best bet. It is a lot of work, um, but it's a lot of self-directed work. Karen Pryor Academy, this is a clicker training academy and our president, Jessica, is a KPA graduate. So if you have questions about this, you can email info at nedtc.org and she will happily talk you through her experience maybe do a Zoom call with you, but she will, she'd love to talk to you about it. Um, from what I can see, no other program breaks down behaviors in quite this way. Um, they are, in my estimation, the most technically skilled trainers I have ever met. Um, so, and their skills, like all of the skills that you're going to learn can work across species, but because of the technical skill level in this program, 
it's going to work a lot better if you want to get into cat training or iguana training or snake training or guinea pig training because tech, your technical skills are going to be unmatched. Um, Academy for Dog Trainers. This is now all online. Thanks, COVID. Um, but they do have a two-year program and it's broken down, my understanding is into four levels and it's very comprehensive. Um, it's a good mix of theory, uh, breaking behaviors down, all of it. And, and one of my interns, Lizzie Flanagan of Lizzie the Good Dog People, Lizzie and the Good Dog People, um, got her certification this way. And I know how hard she worked to get it. Um, and she's a very good trainer and one that I am proud to call a colleague. So um, this is another option for you. This is the one that was in San Francisco that I wanted to attend when I was starting but couldn't afford at the time. If you look at the cost, it might seem like a lot for many of you, especially if you're just out of college. Um, but I would argue that this cost um, is less than going to say a trade school or um, taking on a full curricula at a college or a university. Um, that said, if you're dealing with a lot of debt, this is a lot to take on as well. So do balance that as well as you're thinking about this. For me, I would like to go back and get one of these certifications in addition to my CPDT. Now that I've been doing this for a while, I've got a ton of experience, um, but I would like to get my certification in one of these because these programs and watching my students get them, I have a little FOMO with this. <laughs> like I would love to like get one of these too. VSA. Now, Victoria Stowell Academy, full disclosure, I am a faculty advisor for them, meaning that my students will, they want to be dog trainers, they are taking the online course, and my job is to log in with them from time to time and assess their skills as a trainer. So they'll submit videos of them training a dog, um, training a dog to sit, training a dog to come. Um, I have to walk them through like observational skills or learning theory, but they're very, very short the uh, interactions that I have with these students. Um, most of their work is actually with their teachers and with their, um, with their classmates through this program. This is an online only option. And they also have an in-person and online track as well. They have a free class that you can take if you wanted to try it, just to kind of see what it's like to take, um, take the class. And I think that that's a really good thing to try if you're even thinking about doing dog training, whether or not you decide to go with Victoria Stillwell's program, which I personally love the program. I love how things are broken down. It's at your own pace. Um, and, and the skills, the way they instruct the skills, I think is very good. Um, but I would also say that, um, that because of COVID with a lot of these online trainings, you might not have access to different dogs. The one thing that I would encourage all of you to do is to get your hands on as many dogs as you can and try these skills if the dogs are safe and not upset with strangers. <laughs> like we don't want anybody to get hurt. Um, but I think it's important to, um, to practice these skills on as many dogs as you possibly can. Um, so let's see, our training club has gone on to hire two of the three in-person attendees that we, me and Diane at Every Dog, are both New England dog training trainers. And we have both worked with um, BSA students and we have hired um, two of the three that we have worked with personally. Um, the third one we would have hired, but she lived too far away and it wasn't going to work. Um, but she ended up being an, a behavior evaluator hired at one of the bigger shelter systems in our in our state. So this ended up working out well for her anyway. Local clubs, you can go to local clubs, see many dogs, um, look at a certified dog trainer, connect with them, uh, check out the facilities in the area and just see if you can come and watch. Like that's what a lot of my uh, interns who eventually become assistants do. There's, I don't want to do much. I just want to sit and watch, and maybe talk to you 10 minutes after. Cool. And so I'll sit them down and I'll have them like just watch or I'll say, hey, do you know what stress signals are? And I might give them a worksheet and say, can you see if you can find these? And I'll talk to you after class and then I'll go teach my class and I'll come over and talk to them. Um, not every instructor will be able to have the uh, emotional capacity or the ability to take on interns in that way. But I, I always like having people in my class if it's a good class for strangers to watch. Reactive dogs, probably not. Um, if I have some sensitive dogs in a class, maybe not. Uh, but for the most part, I am happy to have people come and watch my classes. Um, you can have, let's see, oh, stewarding or, or helping out. Stewards is a volunteer 
for an AKC club. So if uh, there's a competition, um, whether it's an obedience competition, um, a confirmation event, um, maybe fly ball or agility or nose work or disc dogs, see if there's any sporting events nearby with dogs and see if they need volunteers. This is a great way where you can go in and you can start to meet dogs, kind of check things out. People always need people to like help people register for these events or hand out swag or like hand out water bottles or whatever, but you can really start to meet people in this way as well. Um, shelter programs, I shout out MSPCA again, I'm an employee. Their dog walking and volunteer program is unmatched in this area. Um, the dogs get exercise. Um, I really think um, handling more dogs is going to help you more than all the classwork in the world. Um, you need to know what you're doing. Um, and I think with guidance and classwork is going to make you the best trainer possible, but unless you're handling a lot of dogs, it's not going to stick as well as it could. So this is an unregulated industry, meaning, right? There are term, these are all terms that people who have called me asking for me to come into their house and help them, or um, people who want to be dog trainers have called and said, hey, I want to be a trainer or a behaviorist. I need a behavioralist for my four-year-old dog who I just adopted. Um, I need a dog psychologist. I need a dog rehabilitator. I, this was my favorite, the emotional dog psychic. Um, these are, um, one of these is real. <laughs> like Two aren't. Um, so guess which ones? Um, the, the trainer is a real thing. A behaviorist is kind of real. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But if you see the word somebody advertising themselves as a behaviorist without a qualifier, that is a red flag. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Behavioralist, that is a political science term. And while I have plenty of friends who are political science uh, majors or degree holders, or even have gone on to work in that industry, they are super smart people. They are not going to be help, able to help you with a Great Dane chewing a couch. Um, a dog psychologist, not a real thing. Dog rehabilitator, also not really a real thing. Um, is this like a veterinarian? Is this a technician? This is a buzzword to try to kind of like, it, it's really good in the marketing world to promote yourself in one of these ways, except for maybe the last one, because that's just, woo, nope, don't do that. Um, but it's really important to keep the language in the back of your head to see if you're going to get swindled. So trainer. So you can, um, trainers generally, though not always, um, we might work with skills, sit, down, stay, touch, come, recall, puppy classes, manners classes, canine good citizen classes, competition classes, sports classes, search and rescue, like trainers who work in search and rescue trainers who work with service dogs. They are working on skills either for a job or for general manners, right? Now, some will also take, and many do, maybe some anxiety cases, separation anxiety, or reactive dogs, but not all. Um, some might take some bite, uh, bite incidences, but not all. Some will take some aggression cases, but not all. Um, for me personally, going back to boundaries, I will take bite levels if it's not a compound anxiety behavior um, up to a level 3B. This is all very nerdy way of saying like I have a specific way on this bite scale, the Dunbar bite scale that I am comfortable seeing clients. If it's not, if it's like my dog doesn't like X and that's it. But if the dog doesn't like X and has separation anxiety and has noise phobia and, and, and and the dog is biting, I'm sending that dog to probably either a certified applied animal behaviorist or a veterinary behaviorist. I'm going to explain why in a minute. A behavior consultant. Now, this is also another term. This is the qualifier I was talking about a minute ago. Behaviorist is a word, and you're going to hear it. You're going to see it. But we as trainers do not get to say what that means. Um, that belongs to the animal behavior community, and we are not it. A behavior consultant, however, that might be somebody who has done more work as a trainer and has gotten additional certification, or maybe not. I can call myself a behavior consultant. Um, I see behavior cases. 
Um, those are maybe more emotionally grounded, anxiety cases, um, skittishness, over shyness. You're not necessarily working on sit down, stay. You're working on confidence. You're working on some other skills to kind of help that dog cope in the world that they're in. Um, usually these people are coming from a dog training background first. So you can get good handling skills, which I would highly recommend. I would not usually recommend people go directly into just behavior without getting the handling first as a trainer. Um, a certified applied animal behaviorist. This is a person with a PhD in an animal related field. Caesar Milan, by this definition, would not be an animal behaviorist. Um, so a certified animal behavior, he's a television personality. Um, certified applied animal behaviorist, PhD in an animal related field, meaning they know a whole lot more about this than I do. Um, there are places where you can um, either be a member or start to kind of look in that direction. Um, or if you need one as a referring trainer, um, you can look at the Animal Behavior Society, AVSAB, or Core Cab. Um, those are some things that you might want to look at. So if you really, really, really know what you want to work in is behavior, going to a college or university and starting your animal um, track. These are people who are in an animal-related field like zoology or biology. Uh, Dr. Patricia McConnell, we're going to talk about her books here in a couple minutes. Um, she is a zoologist and an ethologist and a cab. So it's really important to kind of know um, that these people who have studied a lot, know a lot more about behavior and what makes it work, the brain functions that affect and drive behavior. Trainers were working on skills, applied animal behaviorists, they are also working on skills, uh, but they also know what's going on in the brain. A veterinary behaviorist, there's only one place to find them, dasvb.org, and they are board certified in behavior. Um, they're veterinarians who are board certified in behavior. So if I have a dog who is compulsively spinning or is um, has something that we might see in like compulsive disorder um, or a dog that is, I'm not able to get that, the dog is so maybe uh, freaked out by sounds, even the smallest, sound, I can't find a small enough building block to start that dog on maybe a desensitization protocol where the dog can get comfortable living in an environment. Um, if the heater kicks on and the dog is peeing the floor because the bang of the heater is so uh, traumatizing to this dog, I'm not going to be able to get in there. I might need a vet behaviorist to help with that dog. So if there's a suspected medical component um, or if we need medication uh, to help the dog, behavior modification, or even just, you know, no matter what happens, I can't train out Lyme disease. So like always making sure that your dogs are your clients are going to veterinarians first and then seeing you. Um, but sometimes you need a, a big boy vet <laughs> that does lots of behavior stuff. So these, these men and women are professionals, they're veterinarians, and they're board certified in behavior. Red flags, here we go, party people. Verify certifications and education. So when I was talking about before, um, with this whole idea of like some of my beginnings were from, uh, were maybe not the best. Uh, they were all very red flaggy. Um, the trainer that I worked with had a certification revoked. I didn't know that. Um, well, when I did find out, I didn't know what that meant. I, I can't say I didn't know that. I knew that he had it taken away. I didn't know what that meant. But like, I now know that if I am working with somebody who wants to be a dog trainer and they're trying to find a mentor, don't trust, verify. So if you wanted to work with me, you can look up my certification. You can go to the CPDT website, type in my name and I pop up. Now, some trainers decide not to promote themselves in that way. Maybe there's good reason for them not to have a presence on some of these sites and that's okay. But you can always just email the organization and say, hey, look, I'm, I don't need to know where their business is. I just need to know, I'm thinking I'm mentoring with this person. I can't find them on your website. Can you confirm that they at least have this certification? And that way you know that you're not being fleeced. Um, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. If somebody saying right out the gate, like I was, you can choose your own hours and you can make 100K a year your first year as a dog trainer, that's red flaggy. Gut check. 
are the dogs looking more like this guy in your instructor's class, basic manners class, or do they look more like this? This guy, like you don't have to be an expert in reading body language to know that this guy looks a little stressed out. He's got a little bit of whale eye, his ears are back, he's stress banding, his tongue is very red. He looks worried. His little eyebrows are, he looks worried. Um, so if that's the general feel to the classes that you're going into, that might not be the place that you wanna work. Um, maybe give it a class or two just to make sure, but always listen to your gut. Does it feel culty or is there language? What terms are being used? Um, now, this is the part that I like to talk about a little bit because we all have our language, right? So clicker training, click treat, right? That's language, but it's also a direction. So when I, um, when I hear the word red zone dog, right? That's, that's a, a, a TV show, Nat Geo, little guy, I think he's getting a Netflix show. Um, had an ominous warning at the very beginning of every episode. However, he used the term red zone dog. So if I were to ask you to type what you think a red zone dog is, I'm going to get 30 different answers. Um, Cause we all seem to have it in our head what that is. It's a roar shark test. You see what you wanna see, um, but it's not quantifiable. Um, it's like a roar shark test, like the ink blot. So the word behavior is without a qualifier, right? That's a roar shark test. You hear what you wanna hear. Um, and and you, you can define it how you want to define it, but that's gonna be different than the person next to you, which is why these qualifiers matter. Um, and so like dog rehabilitator, it's another one of those terms that to me, it doesn't mean anything in this industry in, in the way that I think uh, the Zeitgeist has it presented to us, right? So um, does the dog have a limp and you rehabbed him back to health? good for you, right? Like, um, does the dog have an emotional burden and you sat him on a couch and he had a little chit chat and now he's feeling better? Great. Um, a, a rehabilitator, if you're a wildlife rehabilitator, you get certified by your state to take care of wildlife and free them. Um, a dog rehabilitator or a dog rehabilitation center or rehab anything, unless you are a physical therapist or a veterinarian, that word would also have a qualifier, but we're not rehabilitators, we're trainers, um, or maybe behavior consultants, or one of those other things that I talked about before. So listen to your gut, um, don't gaslight yourself, don't let yourself be gaslit. And if there's a term that you hear using a lot, see if you can define it and see if it's quantifiable. And that might give you an indication if this is legit, or if it's not. All right, so I'm gonna make this short because I've been talking for a while, but um, some things they didn't tell me when I got into this, I talked about some of these at the very beginning. Um, details, breeds and names are going to be changed for privacy in case I slip up. But you know, I thought I was going in one day to help a person with uh, training their emotional support dogs um, to puppies. Um, but instead when I walked in, those dogs were trying to bite me. I wasn't feeling very emotionally supported in that moment. And um, it was an actual hoarding situation. Um, that was not something that I had planned walking into that home. And so if you're going to be walking into people's homes, knowing that you can walk into some things that are maybe unpleasant, um, dangerous, um, unsettling can happen. Um, I've walked into situations where it's pretty clear that there's some emotional abuse going on in the home. Um, it's been clear that there have been um, really hard things going on in homes as well. I have been sitting in the middle of married couples fighting to the point where I tried to get up and leave and they both yelled at me to sit down. Um, to, I'm there to help their dog. Um, tensions can be really high. Um, so always, and, and for most women in this industry, we know always have an, a backup plan, but I think it's also really, really, really important to know what your boundaries are. And when you walk in, how to walk out, um, he nips, I think, um, I had walked into a home and they told me like, oh, he nips a little bit as he's jumping at me. They did not disclose this in the intake form. The dog had tried to bite my hand with force, but ended up biting, it was winter, so I had thick gloves on, 
bit it and then took my glove off and ran and was shredding. Like he was not a pleased dog. This wasn't, oh, he nips. Like he was trying to do harm. So I just backed out the door and closed it, called them from the other side of the door. Like, hey, can you get a leash on your dog? Move to the other side of the apartment and I'll try to come in again. Like making sure that when you're doing these intake forms, if you see words like nip, quantify it, qualify it. What do they mean? Because that word nip, sometimes what will happen is your clients will use language to kind of downplay what's really going on because they think that you won't come to help them. Um, maybe they have financial problems and when you go into their home or maybe they've felt judged by other people, when you go into their home, um, trainers tend to charge less than say um, a vet behaviorist. We have different experience levels and we should be charging appropriately. But if somebody's like, well, this person works with dogs and this person works with dogs, this person will come to me a lot sooner than this vet behaviorist before I can see the vet behaviorist who's backed up for six months and I can't afford it anyway. I'm going to go with this person, but he nips instead of is biting at a high level. Um, they need help. They might not have faced like how bad it is yet. Um, maybe they think um, you won't come help them. Maybe they think they can't afford anybody else um, and that this is your one shot. I've been definitely called into homes where they're like, where they have massive problems. They're like, okay, well, we need to fix this today because we can't afford to do anything else. And that goes back to the compassion fatigue that we were talking about at the beginning that get it before you need it, um, get that training before you need it and you will need it for these cases. Um, kids, like again, saying humping in front of children, that's, that's always a good one. Um, Pokemon Go, um, we had a situation a few years ago when Pokemon Go was like all the rage and people were looking at their phones or walking around. We're teaching a New England dog training club class outside and we had two guys just like not pay attention and walk straight through our class, like into the middle of a ring of dogs. Um, didn't even see us at all. We're just like, uh, hello. <laughs> I'm like, my kid plays that game. And then he finally looked up and realized that they were standing in a group, a group of like 10, 12 dogs. Um, so nobody told me about that game. Um, the three big ones, behavioral euthanasia, behavior modification, medication, and rehoming. Even if it's the right call, they're really hard calls to make and conversations to have. So if you think for a minute, you're going to be doing any work in behavior, really get, really know what that conversation is like and know what it's like to sit somebody down and be like, we need to have a serious conversation about rehoming your beloved dog because you have twins on the way and your dog cannot be around any children. And that doesn't mean you don't love your dog. It means you do very much. Um, these conversations are not easy, um, but sometimes they're necessary um, and they're not to be taken lightly at all. Watching trainers, watch trainers train, watch me train, uh, watch Kiko Pup on YouTube, watch Zach George, watch the smart bitches. They are, oh, that's one of my favorite um, YouTube channels. Watch the smart bitches. Um, they're Louisiana dog trainers and they're awesome. Um, watch different kinds of trainers train. Um, Chirag Patel, awesome trainer. And he has some really cool ways to teach drop it in a way that I never learned teaching in a disc dog setting. So like, it's, it's really cool to watch other trainers train, especially under the umbrella of positive reinforcement. Um, and kind of see if you can get some ideas. It's really cool. Um, I also didn't realize how white and how neurotypical dog training spaces are. Um, since the COVID lockdowns, it's been very, very, very important to me to listen to voices that aren't mine. And the dog training world, at least my region, we are lady folk generally identifying and we are white. And knowing, and I've had interns who are neither of those. And having them come into our spaces and hearing some of their stories about what it's like to be either a person of color or a minor, a member of a minority group or a proud member of the LGBTQ community or maybe neurodivergent and having them tell me what it's like or reading their accounts um, in 
what it's like to be in these spaces, we really need to take accountability and we need to find a way to hear what they have to say and, and make these spaces more comfortable for them. So when they want to intern, we're letting them intern just like we would with other white trainers. Um, and I think that this is very, very, very important, especially here in the US and especially, um, I mean, we should have been doing this all along, but we haven't. There's a lot of gatekeeping in this community and it's it sucks um, and we have to own it and we have to fix it. Whisper, I did not know how triggering personally the word, oh, you're a dog whisperer would be. Even knowing fully that it's meant as a compliment, it, I, I can take that in both ways, knowing you mean this really well and also still being like, oh, but we couldn't be further on the scale <laughs> of dog training philosophy. So, so these are just some things, silly or not, that, that nobody told me when I started. So here are some online resources for you. Sparks, this is an awesome, one of my favorite um, uh, lecture series every year that they have it. If you Google Sparks dogs, um, you'll be able to find it. I think it's through the Canine Research Council. Now they're hosting all the videos and you can watch old panels. You can see really great speakers. You can learn about the evolution of the wolf. You can learn uh, <laughs> evolution of the dog via the wolf. You can learn about animal behavior and predat the predatory sequence. Uh, you can learn about genetics uh, with Dr. Eleanor Carlson. You can learn and, and um, some others. You can just hear some really cool dog trainers and dog science, um, the science of canines essentially. And it's so cool if you're into that kind of thing, which if you're here, I hope you are. Um, IAABC, the conference, um, this year they did the Lemonade Conference. And usually I would go to this conference if it was in the Northeast because Northeast, yeah, there's a lot of states, but it's drivable. Um, but you can get CEUs. CEUs are continuing education units. In order to keep my CPDT certification, which I earned in 2008, every three years, I have to get another 36 hours of additional learning credits. So if you are mentoring with somebody who is promoting themselves as a reputable, responsible dog trainer, make sure that they have that certification and that they are going to conferences. Even if they don't have a certification and, and you trust this person and they're a good dog trainer and they're reputable in your region, making sure that they're still getting educated um, because things change over time. Dog training wasn't the same 17 years ago when I started. It wasn't the same last year. So making sure that like you are staying up to date on the, near, the newest science, the newest training, the newest philosophies. So you can incorporate that into your training repertoire. Um, if somebody says that they are educated and that they are, yeah, 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 I got continuing education credits, but they had a CPR class in 2004 and nothing since, maybe just take that under advisement. Although, yes, take that CPR class, but if that's the only thing they have. Um, they also do multi-species, the IABC. So if you're interested in parrots or guinea pigs or horses or cats, like there's a lot of cat behaviorists out there, um, absolutely check out IABC. They do have some free and paid um, classes, courses, webinars, stuff like that. More webinars, uh, Pet Professional Guild, again, force-free, fear-free, pain-free. You can get a membership through them, um, a student membership, even if you are a student. Um, I have the professional membership because professional, um, but this is also where I get my insurance through and you can get your insurance through a couple of these as well. Um, they have free webinars and paid webinars. They have uh, classes you can take, um, continuing education that way if you wanted to get your CEUs or even just learn about anything in this industry. Um, raising canine for dog trainers. This is a dog trainer specific webinar series. So um, if you're interested, I gave a presentation for them um, about um, living in the city with dogs and like the things that we as trainers have to figure out like when we're working in urban centers with our dogs because it's very different than working in a rural environment. Um, so uh, other, um, other online available resources for you, the Barks from the Bookshelf podcast. Nat Light, who helped me on the UK resources that I'm gonna get to here on the next slide. 
um, and Steve Goodall, Mr. Watchdogs from the very beginning, they read all of these cool books and then they talk about them and they invite the authors on to speak. So you get like Clive Wynn and Patricia McConnell and Jean Donaldson and um, uh, Torrid Rugas, uh, Lily Chin, who I mentioned before, uh, Sassafras, from the certified trick dog trainer that uh, you talked about. Um, full disclosure, they invited me on too. And they have the coolest conversations, the coolest books that you should be looking at. Um, so if you ever need some good book recommendations or want to know what's going on in the dog world, free podcast, these guys right here. Modern Dog Trainer, if you're more interested in the business side of things, Ines McNeil, uh, the Modern Dog Trainer is a fantastic resource for you. The Bitey End, if you're really into aggression and aggression cases, um, Michael Shikachio is a fantastic trainer, all positive reinforcement, all aggression. Um, dog Trainer's Quick and Dirty Guide. Um, these are five to 10 minute podcast episodes from a certified dog trainer named Yolanta Benal. She's fantastic. She's got a very soothing voice. I, I just love listening to her podcast. It's really good if you just need like some bite-sized recommendations, especially if you're just getting started, like how to get a dog to stop barking, how to identify problem behaviors, things like that. Animal Training Academy. These are a little bit more deep divey conversations with Ryan Cartledge. Um, he's talked to, again, like Trisha McConnell and uh, Ken Ramirez and a bunch of other big names in our industry. Um, and, and they really get nitpicky about uh, the science behind what they do. So I think this is a really cool podcast for you as well, as well as drinking from the toilet, dog trainer Hannah Berenigan. She has fun and they have great conversations. Um, there are UK resources. I knew yesterday we had a couple people from the UK. So I wanted to make, so I called in Nat Light and she, mwah, thanks Nat for sending me these if you're overseas. So if you are in a different country, you might have different resources. Um, and I think internationally, some of these would also work in the US. So Professional Association of Canine Trainers, PackedDogs.com, Association of Pet Dog Counselors, Fellowship of Animal Behavior Cli Clinicians, Association for the Study of Animal Behavior. And they also have a CCAB accreditation here, which is a Certified Clinical Animal Behaviorist with a U. So now you know that it's like important. Um, so Animal Behavior and Training Council as well. So I think like these are just some more resources. And if you wanted to um, become a member, you can you can poke around on their Facebook pages or, you can, or their, their closed Facebook pages and kind of see what these people are talking about and see what it's like to be in the behavior world if you're into that kind of thing or the training side. Um, I'm just getting a, another spin on it. Books. Other End of the Leash and all of the books by Patricia McConnell. Um, this one here, The Other End of the Leash, is one that I try to reread every couple of years just to keep myself grounded. This is not necessarily a dog training book, but this is more of a um, put yourself in the dog shoes and like how dogs evolved, how people evolved and how we came together and the way that that influences how we talk to each other today. So your dog might like to roll in goose poop and we're like, oh, we like to put perfume on our wrist and hold it up to our dogs and our dogs are like, Ugh. So things like that, even like just the sensory way in which we take in the world. And I think it's going to make you a better trainer. Um, coaching people to train their dogs. Now, Terry Ryan, who wrote this book, also helped write the first CPDT exam. So I use this often as a workbook for people who want to be dog trainers, regardless of what program that they're into. It covers animal husbandry, ethology, uh, training equipment, training exercises, how to construct um, a good class curricula, stuff like that. This is a fantastic book. Um, Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. All the Gene, all the Gene Donaldson books, Accelerated Learning by Pam Reed. Um, I threw my book in here because I think it's also another, like Trisha's other end of the leash, though I'm not comparing my writing to hers at all. Um, I am trying to make the connection that it really puts you in the position of the dogs who live in a city. So dogs, if, as you know, when they circle, they say hi to circle each other. Well, straight lines are the third circle of hell for dogs. Well, what's a sidewalk? What's a hallway and a high rise? They're straight lines. Um, they can smell 40 feet under your feet. So they can smell dinner from four, four floors away. So what is the impact on those dogs? What happens if your neighbor has high heels and they're walking upstairs and your dog is afraid of sounds? Um, so it's really looking at the environmental impact of dogs in both 
predominantly the country, uh, sorry, predominantly the city, foot dogs in the country also benefit as well. Like how to find a reputable trainer, how to find, um, like, should your dog go to daycare? How do you find good help? This basically like a how-to manual for all steps, all dogs with a city spin. And the Dogwise books. Dogwise is a great place if you want to be a trainer and start to like hone your skills. Going to Dogwise, they have tons of books, all dogs, all the time. So def definitely check out Dogwise. And we've done a lot. We have covered so much in this and you stuck with me this far. So here's a picture of my dog pooping out a positive affirmation for you. You've earned it. Um, so yesterday we did have a Q and A. Um, we didn't have very many questions, so we can actually skip right by this. Um, although I really love this image. It makes me giggle. Okay. Um, and this is about me, including my contact information. If you need anything at all, please don't hesitate. Um, again, my name is Melissa McHugh McGrath. I am the author of Considerations for the City Dog. Um, I am the co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, the oldest AKC obedience club in the country. And now you know what all of that means. Um, I also host a little podcast called Be Wilderbeast. It is just the weirdest, coolest ways in which animals intersect at history. And this week we talked about parachuting beavers. So <laughs> if you just want something wacky to listen to that's maybe not world news, go ahead and give it a listen and let me know what you think. And if you have any ideas, you can let me know. Um, my website, melissamccubemcgrath.com. You can email uh, the New England Dog Training Club. We do have classes ongoing, classes online info at nedtc.org, or you can email me personally, considerationsbook at gmail.com. Thank you so much for participating. Feel free to share with your friends if there's anything that I really missed um, in, in regards to being a responsible positive reinforcement trainer for people who want to be dog trainers. Um, let me know. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much. Have a great day.